Okay. At, at some point while totaling up the exam, I realized there were actually 102 points possible on the exam, not 100. So, so some of you have your grade changed when I discovered, oh, I should not be taking like 24 from 100. I should be taking it from 102. So we're kind of wondering why it, it jumped two points out of 102. But in terms of the grade book that's going in is out of 100. So I guess two bonus points for everybody with that because I had two extra points in there at some point. So um, the average was, let's see, the average was about 78. The median was about 88. So half got above 88, half below. Um, so there's actually a lot more space below 88 to, to fit scores in, which is why the average was you know, about 78. So uh, questions from the exam? The most major thing we're going to need from the exam for, for, for heading forward is knowing how to take the derivative of things like 6x to the fourth plus you know, 5x squared plus e to the x. The, those more straightforward derivatives. Because in a couple days, we're, we're going to get to the process of how would we undo that? If we were told what the derivative was, could we figure out the original function? And even if, I mean, if we can, what, what's the interpretation of that? There's one other topic we're going to spend a couple days on before we switch gears to undoing the derivative. But uh, from the exam? <coughs> okay. Well, we're actually going to skip a little bit more in the book, although as I was reviewing my lecture a little bit, I realized I, I failed to pull one, one bit of information out of the lecture, but We've been looking at using the derivative to analyze the function. And we also could do something to, to use the second derivative. That, that's a part we skipped on the second derivative. But, but in all honesty, in most places, if you're really going to have to use some of these techniques, you're not going to have the function to start with. That's where you're going to have to start and figure out, well, what is the function in the first place? Uh, you might liken it a bit to the, the situation in, in, in Egypt when Moses said, Pharaoh, let my people go. And he said, no, I'm not going to do it. Oh, and by the way, the, the, those bricks you've been making, you still need to make them, but we're not bringing you the supplies anymore. You have to go find your own materials and still make the bricks. That's kind of where we are at this point. We've been looking at, for a function, how can we tell where the max and mins are? But we were told the function. Well, in most real-life problems, nobody comes up and says, oh, here's a function, find the maximum and minimum. But there are lots of situations where you're, you're looking at a business. And so you're trying to analyze costs and revenue and figure out, well, at, at what level of production do you expect to, to meet, get maximum profit? So there's, there's a lot of times where you're going to be very interested in maximizing a, a revenue or minimizing a cost that... that Nobody's told you the function for. That's really the first step. You've got to figure out, well, what, what is the function that I'm working with? And that's where we get into what are, what are known as applied problems. Also, you could call them word problems. We, we start with word problems. And I know that's a scary thought for most students. But, but in reality, as, as we go out and encounter math problems, they don't immediately present themselves as math problems. And that, that's another reason I think students often struggle. When am I ever going to need this? Because they'll talk to people and say, well, I've never used algebra in my life. Well, my guess is they have. They just didn't. They've gotten so used to the types of problems they, they're using on, they don't realize they're using algebra. So the, the analysis.
analysis of the function, we could use Wolfram Alpha, and I think I showed you that. I mean, it'll graph it. It'll tell us the first derivative, the second derivative. So, for example, if we go, I don't have Chrome brought up here, but if we would go to Wolfram Alpha, and just say, ask it, let's see, a question from the exam. f of x equals, in fact, let's ask it the last one, 6x to the fifth minus 2x plus 5 to the fourth. That, that was our last derivative problem. And we just tell it the function. And it will say, okay, this is the function. And here's the graph of the function. We could expand it out if you'd like. Uh, but we'll find out where it equals zero. Um, it'll find the derivative for you. It'll find the antiderivative, which is where we'll get eventually. But I mean, it'll find the max and the min. I mean, it'll do all the work if we know how to tell it the function. So we've been putting a lot of time in figuring out how to find the derivative. Wolfram Alpha will do it just like that. So you may be thinking, so why do we put all this time in finding the derivative? Well, as with any fancy technology, if you don't understand what it's doing and you make a mistake, how do you know you made the mistake? You just see the result. So you, you can't, I mean, we, we trust technology. But I'm going to guess you've all had experience where you've trusted technology and for whatever reason that technology has failed and you've had to go to a backup plan. Uh, you, know, you trust your car to start in the morning. You go out and it doesn't start. You quickly have to come up with a backup plan. Uh, you know, there, there are lots of situations like that where we, we need multiple ways to approach things because sometimes our preferred method just, just doesn't work for us. So we need that backup plan. So we've been looking to try to understand the derivative. What's the derivative telling us? Uh, the first derivative tells us whether the function's increasing or decreasing. We didn't actually look at the second derivative. The second derivative will actually tell us whether the function's concave up or concave down. <coughs> I don't think that's enough extra information to justify a day or two on that, because there's some other things I want to be sure to get to. But as I said, most real-world problems don't come up, come to us with, here's the function. Find the maximum or minimum. They're expressed solely in words. Or we collect a little bit of data and we've got to figure out, okay, what is the function that's underlying all of this? And that, that is definitely a challenge to, to pull that together at that point. As we work with the applied problems, most of our work is going to be coming up with the function. And I, I could argue, I suppose, at that point, most of our work really is not with the calculus. The calculus is analyzing the function once we come up with it. But we are going to be looking at, can we come up with a function? So I, I've got way more examples today than we have time to cover. And so I'm going to try to, I, 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 I want to show you lots of examples, but I don't want to rush through them. So it's, it's kind of trying to, to balance that as, as we approach this. Put some terms as we, we get into applied problems. One term is an objective function. In any applied problem, there's some quantity we're trying to maximize or minimize. And our first goal is to sort of figure out, well, what, what quantity we're trying to maximize or minimize, and then how do we describe that as a function? Once we have it as a function, then we can do our calculus to try to figure out, okay, well, what, what is the maximum and minimum, where does it occur? Oftentimes, though, our objective function starts with more than one variable. Our first attempt at maximizing or minimizing something, we've got more than one variable. Now, there are ways we can handle some functions with more than one variable. Uh, this book does a little bit of it, it's called multivariable calculus. We're not going to have time to get there. But, but the book does a little bit with multivariable calculus for what we want. We want one variable, and so typically in most problems, there's a constraint equation. Resources are limited. There's only so much of 
so, say you're, you're constructing something, there, there's only so much time, you only have so many materials, so there's some constraints on what you could actually do. Uh, I mean, you have so much time in the day, you might have wished you could study more for this exam, but you had other classes. So, I mean, there are constraints, and you kind of have to decide, you know, what, in terms of studying, where am I going to put my time that I think will give me the maximum benefit and you have to make some tough decisions sometimes. How does one constraint affect what I can do somewhere else? So, but with that, typically we can kind of get our, our objective function down to one variable. Wrong direction here. So, the, the book gives a, a technique for approaching story problems. Or, and, and their technique is, well, first translate the English statement of the problem line by line into a picture, if that applies, and finally into math. And this is often the hardest step, to try to figure out from the verbal description of what we've got, how does that even translate into something mathematical that we can work with. As we get that, we'll be looking to identify the objective function. What are we really after, ultimately? What are we trying to make largest or smallest? How can I express that in terms of anything? If I get it in terms of two or more variables, probably, well, there will be some sort of constraint somewhere. And we've got to look and try to figure out, okay, how does that constraint impact the two variables? Hopefully we can get it down to one variable. So if we can get the objective function in one variable, then we're finally set to, to, to switch into to calculus mode, take the derivative, figure out where the derivative is zero, to analyze is this function increasing to a max and then decreasing, is it decreasing to a min and then increasing. But before we can get there, we have to have the function. And these problems, most of the time, we don't start with here's the function. It's a verbal description. And so it's very much of a challenge from that verbal description to begin to think, how can I come up with the function? Once we have the function, we can use calculus to, to figure out the, the maximum and min values. Another thing that typically happens, and we really haven't done much of this, most applied problems, there's only a certain range or cer certain domain that, that works. If we're doing something, we have to produce, say, at least so many objects, but we can't produce more. There's not enough time in the day, say, to produce more than you know, 500 objects of whatever we're doing. So that there's a limit on the production. We need to produce at least so many. We can't produce more than so many. So as we look for our max and mins, the endpoints are a possibility as well. We really didn't, haven't looked at that idea yet. Um, but it does come into play here as we think about the applied problems. There's typically a, a very specific closed interval for our, our set of inputs here. <laughs> and, and then another step that is often very much overlooked. If we are successful to get to this point, we're usually just so relieved, I've got some kind of answer that we forget, we really should look back and see, does that answer make any sense in the original scope of the problem? Because we could have made a problem with the math. We could have made a problem with uh, our, our putting the, the problem into math. We could have made a mistake in our calculus. We really want to know, does the question that was originally asked, is, is that really the one we've answered? And, and does it make sense in the, the context of the problem we started with? I mean, in general, this is a step that's very frequently uh, overlooked in solving problems. We work on a problem, we come up with an answer, we're done. We don't think, we should really check this answer, go, go back maybe and check our work, did we make any mistakes, kind of look back. What, what did we learn maybe through the whole process? That's what I hope you do on, when I return exams. You don't just look and say, oh, I, I got a 43 on this exam. You can look and figure out, well, what topics, what, what problems did I miss? Did I miss it because of some silly mistakes? How do I avoid those? Did I miss it because I didn't understand the concept? 
you know, is it too late to try to figure out that concept? So we can look back and learn from those mistakes. We definitely want to look back and see, does the answer we came up with make sense? So we're going to look at a few examples. I picked some of these from some other books. The first one we're actually going to kind of start a, a little bit in the process. So we, we've got this gymnastics clothing. And they're manufacturing expensive hockey jerseys for sale to college bookstores. And, and they can produce them in runs of up to 500. Its cost in dollars for a run of X hockey jerseys is C of X 2,000 plus 10X plus 0.2X squared. So here they actually have given us uh, a formula. It may not be the entire formula we need, but they've given us some sort of formula. So we still, we're, we're kind of starting part of the way into the process because we're not having to come up with this formula in the first place. Now, if we look at it and try to analyze what we think, how does this formula make sense? Well, if we don't produce any jerseys, just to set it up, apparently costs $200 to, to set up the machines, different things, uh, rent the, the space, whatever. It costs $200 or $2,000 just to, to, to start thinking about putting together these hockey jerseys. And then it's roughly you know, $10 per jersey. But there's a little bit of extra here that, that the more jerseys we produce, the, the more they start costing. Which, to be honest, as I think about it a little bit, uh, uh, to me sounds almost the opposite of maybe the way it should be. You would think if we produce more jerseys, we ought to get a little bit more efficient, and eventually they should start costing a little less. You know, the first three or four maybe would cost more, and then a little less. But, but this is the formula they've given us. But the question is, well, how many jerseys should the gymnast clothing here produce per run to minimize the average cost? Not the cost. Now, as this book explains, the reason we're not interested in minimizing the cost, that question is easy. To minimize the cost, just don't produce anything. It'll cost you $1,000. Once you start producing, well, then you're going to get to more cost. But in a business sense, it makes no sense in this case to produce nothing. If you produce nothing, you just, you're out $2,000, but you don't have anything to sell. So minimizing the average cost seems to make more sense here, because if, if we can minimize the average cost, then we can figure out, well, how much should we mark it up to sell them and, and, and figure out our profit at that point. So our first thing is, well, we, we could try to put this in Excel uh, and, and try to brute force this. So, I mean, we could pull out Excel. See if I can get Excel set up kind of side by side with the original question here. So we've got X, our number of units, zero. Plus one, and then the, the cost. We've got this formula. It's 2,000 plus 10 times however many units we produce, plus 0.2 times however many units we produce squared. So it's $2,000 to produce none. Goes up a little bit to produce one. And we can begin to produce this table. Now, we actually need the average cost. <clears throat> if we're not producing any, does it even make sense to talk about the average cost per jersey? See some heads going, no. For, for one, I'm not even sure it makes sense. I mean, the average cost, that's what it costs to produce the one jersey. That, that's not very nice either. So, so at two, how would we figure out the average cost at two? 
I mean, in general, how do we figure out an average? And I told you the average on the test. I guess, to be honest, the, the computer figured that out. What was the computer doing when it figured out the average? Added them all up and divided by how many? So if two cost the $2,000, the average cost is going to be whatever it costs to produce two divided by, well, how many do we produce? Would you agree? That's the average cost. The, the total cost divided by how many we produced. And so we could do that as well here. So notice kind of with each increasing one we do, the average cost is coming down. The cost is going up. But because we're spreading it out over more jerseys, the average cost is coming down. Now, this is still pretty pricey, right? $344. So that, that, that's pretty pricey. But if we keep kind of doing this, we could set up a table. You know, we're still pretty pricey. This is not a terribly efficient strategy. That's where we want to come in and try to use calculus to come up. Because... Maybe we can put it in Excel, but since we could do a run of up to 500 jerseys, I'm not sure I really want to produce this table with all 500 production levels and figure out where exactly the minimum occurs. I, mean, I suppose we could do that. Uh, nope, I went over 500. But, so here we are at 500, and we, and we can do some work to figure out it. it now, where do we see the minimum? But that's a lot of work and not, not terribly efficient. So, we're going to try to approach this via calculus. So here's what they told us. The cost is this. What we need is the average cost. So what formula are we going to be actually analyzing? probably need to turn your clickers back on here. So which of these different versions are we actually going to analyze here? trying to get this into Excel. And even if you're using Excel, you need to know kind of what the formula is. So you can't avoid formulas even if you're going to use Excel to help you out. You're still going to have to know the basic formula, work with the basic formula, but our average cost was the cost divided by x. So in this case, the average cost is the 2,000 plus 10x plus 0.2x squared all over x, which is c. You take the cost divided by however many units, that's our average cost. So, so that's our average cost. The next challenge, if we're going to use calculus to optimize this, we need to know the derivative. So if we start thinking about this, what kind, I mean, how are we going to process this to come up with the derivative? Well, actually, the first thing we need to do, even before the derivative, is kind of think, is there another form we could put this in? So rather than a complicated one fraction, what if we split it up into three fractions? 200 over x 
10x over x and 0.2x squared over x, we get 2,000x to the negative first plus 10 plus 0.02x. That's much easier than to take the derivative. The derivative of the first is 2,000 negative x to the negative second and then plus 0.02. The derivative of a constant is zero. And that, I believe, was one of the options, not one that many people picked, but it was one of the options. We cannot just take the derivative of the numerator and the derivative of the denominator. We could do this with the quotient rule, but it actually, since the denominator is just x, it's much easier to write it as three fractions and do whatever simplifying we can do first, and then just apply the product rule or the, the power rule term by term by term. So we can come up with, with our derivative. So we need to solve when this average cost derivative equals zero. Turns out that's, that's not too bad. So 2,000 or negative 2,000 over x squared equals 0 0.2. Yep. Plus 0 0.2 equals 0. Uh, if we take this to the other side, 0 0.2 equals 2,000 over x squared. Cross multiply 0 0.2 x squared equals 2,000. X squared equals 2,000 over 0.2, which I believe is 10,000. And we get that X is 100. Now, in this case, there are constraints. We need to produce at least one unit for, for this average cost to make any sense. And we're told we can do it in runs of up to 500. So 500 is sort of a, an imposed constraint. There's nothing in the, the original or this equation that indicates we should stop at 500, but, but they imposed a restraint of 500. So we find actually x is a 100 or minus 100, but that makes no sense in this problem. x could be positive or negative, but really needs to be positive. And we could look back at the original function and find, well, the average cost at 100, production level 100, is $50 per jersey. And if we go back to, to what we had in Excel, notice at 100, production level 100, there it's $50 per jersey, and that is the smallest value ever. It, was, it comes down to 50, and then it goes back up. We can, in fact, verify that from looking at the derivative. Before 50, this derivative is, or before 100, this derivative is negative. After 100, the derivative is positive. At 100, then, is where we get our minimum uh, average cost. That's what we're looking at here. So the analysis of the derivative, yes, we do. But most of our work really is kind of getting to the exact function we're going to have to, to try to find the min, min or max up. And we can certainly confirm with derivatives this is the minimum average cost. Now, this other book I had looked at also referred to an article that they said was a classic article. I don't know if it's a classic article or not. Camels and rubber duckies that, that, that someone put together in their blog uh, about that they're releasing some software and they're trying to figure out, well, you know, how should we price it? Because they know if you, if you charge too much, not enough people will buy the software. If you charge too little, well, lots of people may buy the software, but you may not make enough money. And so, so how do you kind of figure out where do you set that price? And, and so... You know, they talk about it's a deep, dark mystery. 
If they charge little, they don't get enough money. If they charge too much, they don't get enough customers and go out of business. And, and so they, they give some, some theory, some, some different theories about how you do this. But in general, the higher the price, the fewer people that will buy whatever the product is. As the price drops, more people would buy it. As the price drops, more people would buy it. And, and notice in this case, in this graph especially, it looks very much like there's kind of a linear relation. And that may be just because of the, the scale they've got here, when they actually graph it on a more realistic scale. It's not exactly a linear relation, but it is a decreasing type function called the demand function. And it kind of looks a little odd, because I, I would think when we think about it, you know, we're free to set the price. The price would be the independent variable. The number of people that, that are willing to buy it then is the result. But this is set up more, you know, if you want 200 people to buy it, set the price at this level. If you're willing for 400 people to buy it, set the price at this level. If you only care that 800 people buy it, set it at this level. But there's a relationship between the number of people that would buy the product and the price you set for it. When we consider problems like this, we're going to assume that relationship is linear. So if we just had a couple data points, we could figure out exactly what that relationship is. But we're going to assume it's linear. And so he, he goes on and on and, and changes some things and puts some other things together. So you can look more at that. But the whole setting of prices it is a pretty complex scenario, typically. It is usually more and more complex than a simple linear effect. But for our purposes, we're, we're going to look at them as linear. But the idea they're typically inverse related. The higher the price, the lower the demand. The lower the price, the higher the demand. And somewhere in the middle, there, there's a sweet spot where you can get kind of just the right price with just the right demand to actually <coughs> maximize your revenue. That's what you'd be looking for, is trying to figure out what price should we set. Yes, if we lower the price, we could sell more, because it, but if it's a, a lower price, we get less money. And so, so how do we figure out where that ought to be? Well, we need to figure out first how demand and price are related, then how does that translate into uh, what kind of revenue we're going to get, and then, how do we translate that into figure out, well, where is the maximum revenue? So let's look at a sort of simplified version. So we've got a film and we're releasing a film on video. And we've decided, maybe we did a little market research and decided, you know, if we, if we set this price at $12 for video, we could sell 80,000 copies. Whereas if we set it at $15, we can only sell 50,000 copies. So we've got those two pieces of data, and, and at the moment, that's it. And we're going to assume there's a linear relation between these two, that the demand and the price are linear related. So. When we set the price at $15, we could sell 80,000. When we drop the price, oh, sorry, 50,000. When we drop the price to $12, then we could sell 80,000. Would you agree with those two data points, there should be a line that connects them that would, that would describe this in general? And so there, there, there would be a price somewhere up here that we could set where nobody would buy it, which is too high. And a price, if we set the price at zero, there's only a certain number of these we could even just give away. It's not unlimited. Not everybody wouldn't want it, even if we were just giving it away. 
So we've got this line, and we've got to kind of figure out, okay, well, what is it? So we're going to assume a linear relationship on the demand equation. Well, ultimately, our goal is we want to maximize our revenue. What price should we set to maximize the revenue? So as we think about revenue, I mean, that, that's our ultimate goal. How are we going to figure out uh, our revenue for, for this situation? As we start selling our videos at certain prices, how are we going to figure out how much money comes in? Is it just the price? Is it just the number who buys? Are we multiplying the number who buys and the price? Are we adding the number who buy and the price? buy times whatever price they're paying, that is our revenue. So ultimately that's what we want to find out. Our revenue is the number of people times the price. Or in the, the case of what we got here, the demand times the price. And we, we realize the demand and the price are related. We don't have the exact relation yet, but we realize they're related. Well, here in fact is kind of our first step. We've read the problem. There's what we want to maximize and minimize. Revenue is the demand times the price. That's two variables. There's more information in the problem that is going to somehow enable us to get rid of one of the variables. Because the, the, these are, in fact, related. So that's kind of our next challenge to undertake is, can we push on this a little harder to figure out how the revenue or how the demand and the price are related. So we can get our revenue to one variable, not two. So as we start thinking about the demand equation, in a very real sense, we've got two points on a line. And I actually switched them here. Um, so I thought it was a little easier to think of price and demand. So when the price was $15, 50,000 people would buy it. When the price dropped to $12, 80,000 people would buy it. Because in a certain sense, it, it to, to me it makes more sense that the price is the independent variable. We're setting the price and then trying to figure out well how many people would buy it. But again, we're going to assume this is a linear relation. Well, as such, we should be able to figure out the slope of this line. So as we work with this, what's our slope going to be for this line? Remember how we calculate slope. Change in output over change in input. If we do that here, what are we going to get? See our change in output, 80,000 minus 50,000. Change in input, 12 minus 15. 30,000 over minus 3, minus 10,000. And if we start thinking, does that really make sense? Well, if I go over 3, notice the demand drop by 30,000. Okay, that, that, that kind of matches with that, the slope being negative, and that's, that's what most of you got, or about half of you got, that our slope here would be minus 10,000. I've got it wrong here. I mean, it should be minus 
I guess I couldn't decide when I was doing this which way. So I'll, I'll fix this. Our slope is actually here minus 10,000. So actually, I can't really ask you. Actually, I can't ask you. My choice is here. All involve a slope of minus 10,000. So that part's right. So we can work through and figure out, well, what's the equation of the line? Knowing it goes through, say, this point, and we have this slope, we should be able to come up with the equation of the line. What are we going to get as we try to work with that? Or if you look at the equations given, which of those equations actually goes through these two points? So in general, the equation of the line is y equals mx plus b, but our variables aren't here y and x. I've called them actually q and p, the, the quantity we sell, the price we sell it at. So say if we use this one, 80,000 is the quantity we sell at a price of 12. And so we could solve, and we find that b here is 200,000. So if we back all this up, it goes through 0 to 100,000. So even if we set the price at 0, we could only give away 200,000 of these videos. And we wouldn't make any money, but we could give them away. So we've got our basic equation. The quantity is 200,000 minus 10,000 P. So for every increase of a dollar in the price, our sales go down by 10,000. That's in fact what the slope tells us. So we've got now how Q and P are related. We need to take this a step further. Okay, now let's figure out the revenue. We decided the revenue was the number who buy times the price. So what are we going to come up with is the revenue in this case, the, the way we've moved from the work we've got so far. Quantity, the 200,000 minus 10,000 P times the price, which was option, option B here. It's our quantity times the price, number who buy times the price. Now that we've got a formula, we can start analyzing this. And again, a lot of this work we probably could have done in Excel. It'd been a little bit harder in Excel. Let me add a new sheet. I mean, we could have, say, price, uh, quantity, and then revenue. We had started here with what a price of twelve dollars. We could sell eighty thousand. 80,000. And so the revenue is the quantity times the price. We decided at 
15, we can only sell 50,000. So we get, what, 750,000 from that. And, and even from the fact that, that every time the price goes up a dollar, we lose 10,000 in sales. I mean, we could have kind of filled in the table. So we drop sales by 10,000, we drop by 10,000, now we drop by 10,000. However, the whole point of Excel is to rely on formulas, not just organize our data. I mean, organizing our data, I think, is important, but we'd really like to, to use formulas. I mean, I guess we could go back as well. If I go back, what if I drop the price to 11? How, how many people would buy this at that point? Every time I raise it by a dollar, the price or the number of people drop by ten thousand. It's going to go up by ten thousand. We go up to ninety thousand. <coughs> so I guess we could, from here, kind of fill in a table and say, well, this cell is going to be ten thousand more than the previous cell as we work our way up, or the cell below it. Oops. And kind of work with this and then try to fill everything in um, kind of above and below and hope somewhere in there we see the maximum revenue. Looking at this, do we spot where the maximum revenue is? Looks to be what? Set the price of 10 and sell 100,000 of these, and your revenue will be a million dollars. Now, we, we didn't in this case ever really look at, well, what's it cost to produce that 100,000? That, that would also be a factor to con consider. But as we look at this, we are looking at some very simplified versions. I know they don't look very simplified, but real-world problems, th these are very simplified versions, just to, to kind of get a sense of that. So we, we could work here with Excel, but we're going to get exactly the same answer if we analyze this with calculus. We decided here this is now our formula for the revenue. Two hundred thousand minus ten thousand P equals P. Let's finish up now with calculus rather than brute force it in Excel. So we'll, we'll try calculus. So first thing for this probably is let, let's multiply it out because it'll be easier to take the derivative if we get rid of the product. So if we multiply this out, what are we going to end up with here? We distribute the price through, through it is the 200,000 P minus 10,000 P squared, which was C, which everybody said that, that, that answered. We can take the derivative. I didn't ask you for the derivative here, but the derivative of something times P is just the constant. And the derivative of something times p squared is the constant times 2p. And so our derivative here is 200,000 minus 20,000 p. And we can solve then and figure out, okay, when is that going to be equal zero?
200,000 would need to be 20,000 P, divide both sides by the 20,000, and we've got some big numbers, so it is a little harder to do kind of in our head, P equals 10. In this sense, we probably didn't have to do this in our head, because we already did it with Excel and realized P equals 10 should be the right answer, but P equals 10 also fits with what we just did calculus. It's just, the calculus will always work. Trying to brute force it in Excel will not necessarily always work for it. The max or min may not be in the table. Uh, it may be a lot harder to figure out how to produce the table. Typically, even to produce the table for, for lots of different variables, values, we essentially have to come up with this formula anyway, or all the important pieces of that formula. If we're going to work that hard to come up with the formula, let's go ahead and use our calculus on it. Yeah, we could put that formula into Excel, but it'll be easier in the long run, I think. But let's just use the calculus on it. So when revenue is 10, or when the price is 10, we would already figured out the revenue. 200,000, actually minus 100,000 times 10, uh, we ended up here with a million. Probably should put some commas in there, like we typically do with big numbers. So definitely here, I think the, the hardest part of the whole process really was coming up with how, how the, the quantity and the price were related. And we were told it was linear. So even with that, it, it was not as complicated as a, a real life situation would be, where it'd be a lot harder to figure out how exactly are the price and, and the, the demand related. We know they are. Intuitively, it makes sense that they would be. You raise the price, fewer people are going to buy it. But, but how do you describe that with any kind of function it is certainly a challenge. Okay, we're going to switch to something kind of different here. So more of a geometric approach. We want to fence a rectangular area in our backyard for a garden. One side of the garden uh, is already along the edge of the yard and is already fenced. So we only need to fence the other three sides of the rectangle. We want to have, oh, and we have 80 feet of fencing available. What dimensions sh should we make our garden so it has the largest possible area? Now, hopefully this problem doesn't seem too contrived. I mean, it, it, it's a situation somebody might actually encounter. They, they've got 80 feet of fence. They want to put in a garden. They'd like to make it as big as possible. How are they going to do that? And we're set up here in that we've got one side of the fence kind of already exists. So we're putting the 80 feet around the three other sides. And we've got to figure out, okay, you know, how exactly are we going to do that? So as we start thinking about this, uh, let's try to first identify our objective variable. What are we after? Maximizing and minimizing. Is it the feet of fencing available? Is it the dimensions of the garden? Or is it the area of the garden? So we're interested in maximizing or minimizing something. What exactly are we trying to maximize and minimize here? the objective variable. We don't have the function yet. Our objective variable here is why did this jump over here? was the area of the garden. That's what we're trying to get largest, right? We want the largest possible area. That's, that's exactly what it says, largest possible area. 
So as we see the problem, that, that's kind of what we're looking for. What exactly are we trying to make either largest or smallest? That's our objective variable. So same scenario. Now we're going to say, well, try to think, what, what's constrained? Is our constraint the feet of fencing available, the dimensions of the garden, or the area of the garden? constrained is the feet of fencing available. We only have 80 feet of fencing there in the first place. We can draw a picture. I mean, would you agree this seems a reasonable picture for, for the scenario described? We've got an existing fence we're looking to put it along three other sides. And we're only going to consider a, a rectangle. We're not going to try to consider is, is there, you know, could we do a semicircle or some other weird shape? We're going to do it as a rectangle with our 80 feet of fencing. So I, I drew the picture. Uh, I put in some variables because I, I don't know what the width is, I don't know what the length is. What I'm going to be trying to figure out. Ultimately, what is the width and the length that will give me the maximum area? So I, I want the maximum area, but I know that's, that's related to the dimensions. So I'm interested in the dimensions. I'm probably going to have to find the dimensions to get my ultimate answer. Now, we decided our objective function was the area in terms of the picture I just drew. What's our objective function? We're working with area. What do we need to do with our variables here to figure out the area? general is length times width. So here our area is x times y. Now, as is often the case, when we come up with a formula for our objective variable, the formula here involves two variables, x and y. For us to do calculus, we need one variable, not two. So we kind of move to the next thing. There is a constraint here. So we've got to think, okay, what's our constraint equation? So as we start working with this, based on our picture here, what would be the constraint equation? got some different responses here. Some said 2x plus 2y equals 80. Well, well, in one sense, that seems to make sense because we've got a rectangle. The perimeter is 2x plus 2y. But we don't need 2y because this part already has a fence. 
our 80 feet of fence is not going here. It's going around here. X plus Y plus another X. Our constraint here is that 2X plus Y equals 80. X plus Y equals 80 leaves a gap over here. So it's 2X plus Y equals 80 that is our constraint. So we've got a constraint equation. We could solve for x in terms of y or y in terms of x. y in terms of x here would be easier. So if I start solving for y in terms of x, what am I going to end up with here? Well, I could just subtract 2x from both sides and get y is 80 minus 2x, which is c. I might mention x equals 40 minus y over 2 is true, but it's not solving for y. So that's what we get if we actually try to solve for x. And we could do that, but we do end up dividing by 2 and get some fractions in there. So it's much easier here, I think, to solve for y in terms of x. Now, before we kind of jump into the calculus, let's think of are there some restrictions on the variables in general. Because as far as this formula goes, x could be anything, and y could be anything. But if we look at the problem itself, can x really be anything? Well, x has to be positive. I mean, we've <laughs> x being negative, we can't really put some negative fence to make a longer y, and that, that, that doesn't work. So x has to be at least 0. And also, it doesn't really make any sense to have x be equal to 0. Makes no sense. Let's put 80 feet of fence right up against here. That, that's not going to give us any area. What about the other end? How, how big could x be? What do you think? Okay, so why do you say 40? Well, because, I mean, you wouldn't have any space in between, but, like, 80 divided by 2. Okay, yeah, so if y is 0, yeah. x would be 40. So, so x is between 0 and 40. You're right, if it was 40, go out 40, come back 40, no space in between. So, so there's kind of a sense in this case, our two extremes don't give us any area. So if we find a, a potential peak or valley, it, it should be a peak. It should be our maximum because of the two extremes, x equals 0 and x equals 40, we really don't have a rectangle at all. We don't have any kind of area. Well, if we combine what we had here, with what we have here, we should get a formula for the area. The area is x times 80 minus 2x. And from there, we could use some calculus to start analyzing it. Oh, I actually gave you this. So x times 80 minus 2x. That that's now our area. Uh, to take the derivative of this, it'll probably be best to simplify this first. So what happens if we start trying to simplify this? minus 2x squared.
what's our derivative going to be here? Derivative of 80x is 80. Derivative of 2x is, or excuse me, 2x squared is 4x. So we get a derivative here of c. And this would equal 0 when 80 minus 4x is 0. x equals 20. Now, the, the original problem was, I don't remember. We definitely need to go back and look at the original problem. I, I don't remember if it was, what are the dimensions? Or what's the maximizing area? I mean, they're related. So, just because we got x equals 80, the answer is probably not x equals 80. The answer is, probably we're asked, what are the dimensions 20 by 40? Or what's the maximum area? Maximum area would be what happens when we plug in x equals 20. We get 20 times 40. We, we get 800. So we do need to be careful. I mean, if we have successfully gotten to this point, we are so relieved we have some value for x that we're like, oh, I'm done. Well, probably not quite. Because you want to go back and check. What was the question in the first place? It was not, what is x? We came up with x. The question, I mean, there, there are variations on this. The question could be, what's the maximum area? The question could be, what are the dimensions? The, could be, the question could be, you know, what, what's the length of the garden? Or what's the width? It's, it's a little less likely to be about the length or the width because they didn't really draw a picture. And, and we could draw it different ways where... I mean, length and width on a rectangle are a bit more subjective because we tend to think length is longer. And that's kind of how we think of most dimensions. Length is longer. But you know, if you're shopping for you know, uh, a dresser, a piece of furniture, you, you can read the dimensions. Height is pretty standard, but sometimes you have to think of you know, depth and, and width. I'm not sure they even say length and width. It's, it's like how wide is it and how deep is it and, and how high. But there, there are three dimensions. But there are times if you just say dimensions, there could be some misunderstanding on which dimension's which, especially depending on what you're looking for. Uh, my wife and I are, are doing some shopping looking for a sink to put in our laundry room. 18 by 24. Well, for where we want to put it, 18 by 24, there, there are a couple different sizes, and only one of those really works for, for where we want to put it. We want it to be 18 inches deep. No, we don't. We want it 18 inches wide and 24 inches deep. Because we don't want to take that 24 inches of, of this direction. We've got 24 inches this direction. So, so as we look, it's like, is that really the size we want? We have to think. 18 and, So there are times the dimension, it, it matters which dimension's which, but you definitely have to look and, and read carefully. Now, do we have, I don't know, in two minutes we've got time. I, I, I think we'll, we'll we, we may pick this up, or we may just the next time go through quite a bit of the homework. So there's homework assigned from section 2.9 that we've been looking at. See what you can do with it because it's, it is very challenging and uh, we'll take questions on that the next time. And let's see, a few people came in late, so be sure to sign in. I do have your test to return as well, so if you happen to come in late, uh,